Hi there. In this video, I'm going to discuss time and time travel concepts. <clears throat> now first, I want to cover some general information about time. And this has come to me as a fairly recent acquisition of knowledge. Now generally we think of time as a linear thing, kind of like a hallway that we can walk up and down in. We don't consider ourselves fixed into one point in time. But actually, we are fixed. We're fixed into the present, which has exactly, it's a point in time, with exactly zero length. It's a point in time. It's a point that is moving along this line of time. Line might not be the right word, but a point which is moving through time, however you want to put it, moving in time. Now, our, our concept, which this changes our concept of the past and the, pre and the future. The past and the future. The present. The present is actually this point in time. And the past is is the history of, of past events, but the past itself lacks any real existence. Only the present exists, and the present has a zero length of time. So the past can be considered to be to exist in the present. If we're talking about particles, the past would exist in the present as the inertia of the particle in the present. The inertia of the particle in the present represents all of its past history, all of its past interactions with other particles. So its inertia in the present is the only remnant of its past that exists, and its inertia only exists in the present. The present is where all change happens. All change, if I can just spell, all change happens in the present. Only in the present. This is a very important concept, and when I made my acquaintance with this idea, it, it took a lot of contemplation to really get a hold of it. The past and present exist only in the future. They lack any separate existence by themselves. And the future exists as dreams in, in terms of uh, subjective terms. The future exists only as dreams. And the past exists only as memories. And really, when we recall our dreams, we're recalling the memories of the dreams. So the past and the future exist in the present really only as memories for people. And the future, as far as particles goes, is we can measure present the present inertia, position velocity of a particle and predict what it's going to do. But as soon as we measure it, you know, those measurements fade into the past. We can do a reasonable prediction for a near future, but really we're dealing with the present. Only the present has existence. This is kind of a big shift from thinking of time as a, a continuous 
hallway or something that we can walk up and down in. We're locked into a present which has zero length of time. And that present moves through time. And what's interesting, I'll throw this in here real quick, what's interesting is, regardless of how quickly this, this present moves through time, the flow of time would always seem the same to us, whether this, this is moving slowly or quickly, quickly, or if it even stops, if the present stops in time, we would not notice that it stopped in time. Because our measurement of time is all relative. We measure time by watching the motions of things, the peri periodic motions of things, planets around the suns and whatnot. So if time were to stop, our, our thoughts would stop, our awareness would freeze, and we would not notice that time had stopped. And the same thing, if time is moving more quickly in a universal setting, where everything speeds up, the planets would be going around the sun faster, our thoughts, the molecule, molecular chemical reactions in our brains would be going faster, and we would not notice that time had sped up or that it had slowed down. Time is a very strange thing. Okay, so the main idea here is past and present exist, past and future exist only in the present as memories or, or what's the word I'm looking for here? Inertia. So here, concept one. Actually, there's two concepts here. One will be past and present, past and future exist in present to change occurs only in present. Okay, now our next concept is a general concept of time travel, traditional concept of time travel. Point A, point B, point C. Now if we are at point C in time, this is our present, is point B, point B. <laughs> Our present is point B in time. If we are at point B in time, traditionally, people have said only backwards travel in time is possible because in history, history has occurred. These, these actions, these events have occurred so that we can now travel back into an event that has occurred. But the future has yet to occur so there's no, no events there that we can travel forward to because the future has yet to occur. This, this, is our, this is generally why people say only backwards travel in time is, is, is possible because traveling into the future, which has yet to occur, has yet to create an existence, anything, any events to travel forward to. So... Here we have concept three, which is backwards travel only. Backwards time travel only is one of our classical time travel uh, problems or constraints. Okay, and Second classical time travel problem is, they call it the grandfather paradox, but let's generalize it and call it the ancestor paradox. We are at point B in time, and somebody decides that they don't like life, and they want to go back and kill their ancestor. So they go back in time to point A, and kill the person who would have become their ancestor, thus guaranteeing that their existence will, will fail to come about. Now the paradox is, since they've gone back in time and killed their ancestor, how can they have 
been created in the first place to be in a position to go back in time and kill their ancestor. Therein lays the paradox. If they prevent their own existence, then they've pre prevented themselves from going back to prevent their own existence. Paradox. Now, the interesting thing is that modern thought on time travel has now taken the perspective that point B in time and point A in time are actually separate universes. They call them timelines. I call them universes, and I'll get to that more on that in a bit. But they say that these are independent Timelines. Right. A. A and B. Independent timelines. So that if a person from timeline B travels back in time, which would be the equivalent to traveling back in the history, in B's own history, but instead they've changed timelines, so now they're traveling to a, a point in time that's in a different timeline, independent. Events in each of these timelines are independent. And they kill the equivalent in timeline A of their ancestor, then the only thing they've accomplished is preventing the equivalent of themselves in this timeline A when, when this timeline A gets to the time that point B was at and point B will move forward to another time. They will have prevented the existence of their equivalent selves from timeline A from being in existence at point B. And so, independent timelines, I like to think of them as different universes, and a lot of people tend to call these like parallel universes, parallel in existence. So traveling from point B in time back to point A in time is actually traveling to a parallel universe. This eliminates concept four, ancestor, paradox. Okay. This parallel universe paradigm eliminates the ancestor paradox. Okay. All right. Now, let me forward that concept. Time is generally thought of, traditionally, as this linear thing, as I have explained before. And the notion of parallel universes typically lines up a number of universes parallel in existence at the same point in time. And all of these universes proceed through time in parallel. Now, obviously, if traveling back in time, they're going to introduce the concept of traveling back in time as going to one of these different parallel universes, then the parallel universes must be spread out in time as well, not, not anchored to one point in time. So, if we rearrange this idea of parallel universes, so that the universes are now spread out in existence in a serial fashion through time, instead of all lined up in a parallel fashion at one point in time,
we now have tied in very intimately and satisfyingly the concept of multiple universes existing in a serial fashion spread out in time. I find this to be very satisfying paradigm that rings with the air of truth to me. Now we know that matter is spread out through the universe, not just piled into one little section of the universe, but spread out fairly evenly throughout the whole universe as far as we can tell. So why would existence you know, pile up all these parallel universes or multiple universes on one point in time? It's just ridiculous. You know, it, it seems natural that if there were multiple instances of universes, they would be spread out through time as matter is spread out through space. Now, the interesting consequence of this paradigm is that travel in the future direction of time is also possible. Because you're traveling to the present of a universe that is located, that is locked in to a point farther down the river of time. So this serial universes, okay, concept five, serial universes, takes care of the backwards only time travel resolves the backwards only time travel problem. So our two traditional problems with time travel are oh, a traditional constraint of time travel and a traditional paradox of time travel have thus been resolved through the concept of serial universes. All right, now, once again, time has traditionally been represented as a linear thing. It has no beginning or end, flows only in one direction, right, linear time. Now, what if time was not a line, but was actually a circle that repeated. This, I believe this may be called closed time. I like to call it looped time. And we have here T0. T0 is the moment that the Big Bang initializes. And so we have a period here. This is the Big Bang, or Big Expansion. And at some point in the cycle of time, we have another point here, which is a point of stasis, where the universe stops expanding. And then after this point of stasis, it starts contracting. And then we have, moving back towards T0, the big crunch. This is looped time and our serial universes would be spread out evenly throughout 
this grand cycle of time. It seems to me I'm very comfortable with this. It, I have an intuitive uh, satisfaction with this paradigm of time. And we see the big crunch and the big bang happen continuously for, for all of these multiple universes, serial universes. They're all going through the process of you know, at any, at any given time, one is going through the process of the big crunch to the big bang, transition. So there's kind of a continuous creation in time as a whole. But for any individual serial universe, there's the present which has to travel, you know, traverse through the whole cycle of time before it repeats the cycle. Okay, now this, this arrangement, in contrast to, say, you know, loading up all of the multiple universes on just one moment in, in the cycle of time, and then all of these would be, you know, transferred to just, just this one moment to go around this, this cycle and, and, and absolutely maximize, maximize lopsided fashion. This uh, arrangement of multiple universes in parallel in time seems to me to be absurd. It's just so lopsided, unworkable, and probably just, you know, you couldn't even make it work. Um, model it, model anything that would make that work. So the cyclical nature of time seems to me to be the way things would get. If parallel, if multiple universes exist, they, it seems to me that they would certainly be spread out evenly through time. Okay, now. So, this is Serial universes, six, loop time, which I also believe may be called closed time. I forgot to put something in my notes. Okay, now the next concept here. we have time and this I'm still re, re, addressing time in a looped manner we're just representing it for this diagram as linear if we think of the serial universes as being at the bottom of an energy well. Thus we have the amount of energy here that would be required To get out of one energy well, you have to get over this energy hump to get into the next, the adjacent serial universe. And then to get into the one after that, you'd have to this add this incremental amount of energy, require it, to get into the one after that. And to go to the third, you'd have to add the incremental energy yet a third time to get into the next adjacent serial universe. 
This is directly equivalent to uh, obtaining, adding energy to an object so that it can obtain escape velocity and escape the gravity well of the Earth to go into orbit or beyond. So we have here the escape energy to get out of the current serial universe and get into another. Now, whether to get to, to, to keep continue traversing through time in this manner, it, in this universe, you're, you're traversing to the present of the next serial universe. You're not traversing to your own future. You're leaving your own timeline, traversing to the next present. And what's interesting is that were you at some point in this to return to your original timeline, which you will be, as, as you go through different universes, you will be experiencing present aging, travel through time as all of these serial universes progress through time. So if you were to travel back to your original timeline, the timeline, the universe that you originally left from, which presumably the universe in you would experience time as, at equal rates for all the time that you were left, you were gone, right? Your timeline is, your serial universe is progressing through time. So at the time of your return, say if you, re you, you experience, say, three hours out of your timeline, your own serial universe will experience those three hours too, so that when you return, you're returning just as it, you would be the same age when you return as if you had stayed there and for those three hours. You know, you'd be gone for three hours and then you return. So if you, traveling in time and then returning to your own timeline, you haven't really traveled, you know, you haven't gained or lost any amount of time. It's like you simply went on vacation from your job and came back a specific amount of time later. So this, this concept of time travel, even though you're traveling in the greater scheme of, of the river of time, with regards to your own serial universe, time travel to your own past or present is impossible. And this resolves, you know, all of the, the traditional constraints and problems of time travel. It also changes the, the, uh, the benefits or gains by traveling through time um, significantly. It's just a whole new perspective. Now, whether it's possible to add this amount of energy and say travel more than one adjacent serial universe away has yet to be determined, and we'll let the mathematicians have at that, work out that problems. Um, but again, this visual paradigm makes it evident, you know, conveys that it's equally viable to travel in the reverse direction of time as it is to travel in the forward direction of time. And since you're traveling to independent universes, there are no paradoxes or restrictions on the direction of time travel. Okay, I think, oh, here we go. Now, the distance in time between two adjacent serial universes. I believe this is going to be related to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle describes how once you get smaller than a particular scale of measurement that as you try to increase your position, reduce your scale of measurement on the position of a particle, the margin of error for the velocity of the particle increases. And then as you try to 
and conversely, as you try to reduce your scale of measurement for the velocity of the particle, your margin of error on its position increases. So you have this reciprocal relationship between measuring the position and the velocity of a particle. And I believe the mechanisms responsible for the observations that it led to the development of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle are, are at operation here in the separation in time of the serial universes. And this distance between serial universes, I think Heisenberg's uncertainty principle will come in to be of fundamental importance. Okay, so our seventh concept here will be Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Okay, now... And these are universal energy wells. So we got eight here. Okay, now, our last concept that's related to time, and not necessarily time travel, will be, in many TV shows, and I'm thinking of Battlestar Galactica in particular, they have this concept of loop time. And then they go on to say that everything that is happening now happened before and will happen again exactly as it is happening now. This is called determinism. And it's one of the most depressing concepts I have ever made acquaintance with. It's also called a deterministic view of the universe. And so, as determinism would have it, the sequence of events that happen as things trans progress through this grand cycle of time are predetermined by their starting conditions. So that all events in life are, are scripted by the starting conditions and that any individual lacks any ability to change what's already been slated to occur. This concept, as I may have said, is one of the most depressing concepts I've ever made acquaintance with. I feel that it's only useful <laughs> thing is to demoralize individuals and perhaps make them so much, that depress them so much that they accept an end of human civilization scenario. It's just, it's just utter, utter philosophical rot. It completely ignores the concept of free agency. AKA free will. Now, it has been noticed through a study of evolution 
that animate life progresses from lower, lower states of order to higher states of order. Uh, you know, this is a no-brainer. Creatures progress from lower forms of life to higher forms of life. And in doing so, the usage and movement of materials through the environment moves from lower movement of materials through an environment, say the Earth, to a higher level of movement of materials through the environment. Now, what does this mean? It means like birds eat fish from the ocean and then drop their droppings on land and the animals eat stuff in one place and excrete the waste at another place. They move materials that uh, all kinds of movement of uh, biological materials through the oceans, out of the oceans, onto land, back and through, that this, the flow of materials, and this is, the studies have been done on this, increases as times go by. So, the deterministic view of the universe breaks down when it comes to animate life, where the exact opposite happens. And this is the exact opposite of determinism is called negentropy. Well, perhaps not of determinism, but entropy in thermodynamics, the laws of thermodynamics say that any state uh, that higher orders, higher levels of order invariably progress to lower levels of order, that enthalpy progresses to entropy, you know, uh, invariably. But again, as this is applied to animate species, the exact opposite happens, and this is called negative entropy. Or negentropy, for short. Now, negative entropy, I view as the consequence of free agency upon the environment. Free agency changes and randomizes the sequence of events from what would one would believe to happen if things were absolutely deterministic. That is, if all events were controlled by their starting conditions. So, with this view, that free agency randomizes the sequence of events to some extent, greater or lesser. I mean, there's, very, there's a small amount of animate life compared to a larger amount of inanimate matter. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a small extent, but because free agency can randomize the sequence of events at all in a universe throughout its passage through a grand cycle of time, what we have are starting conditions and then randomized sequence of events which end up in a randomized ending conditions. Randomized, and then if we view this sequence of events as a random number generator, that any events, all the possibilities of events at any given point in time, if we enumerate these possibilities, and then record which possibility actually comes, transpires as, as history, we can kind of use this grand cycle of time as a random number generator, generating random digits as events are recorded throughout the cycle, and the whole thing can be considered a random number generator. And then, this can also be viewed as similar to 
an irrational number whose digits never repeat the same. They just keep on progressing in random fashion, never repeating sequences of numbers, larger and larger sequences of different numbers. So then we could also view this as uh, a random number generator and our randomized ending conditions as a randomized seed for the next cycle of the random number generator. That means we have randomized starting conditions as a direct result of the randomized ending conditions. This mixture of deterministic laws of physics under the influence of free agency guarantees that each and every cycle through of a universe through this time will be unique. Now, whether in the absence of free agency, whether the ending conditions would result in the same sequence of events as the previous sequence, that, that remains to be, you know, that could be argued that, that the sequence is the same or the sequence is different. You know, it, it all depends on the process of that transition from the ending state to the beginning state. So that even without free agency, every cycle may be different. When you add free agency into the, the mix, I think every cycle is guaranteed to be different. Unless, of course, there's something in the transition period which resets the, the ending conditions to a, you know, like zeros, all zeros, re reverses it to all zeros, which I don't think happens. That's, that's kind of too presumptuous. But there you have it. Determinism, free agency, negentropy. And that will be our last concept here. Number nine, uh, free agency as related to time. All righty, there you have it. I believe that is all I have to cover, to discuss in this video. Um, please let me know if I have forgotten to discuss anything important, if I have gotten something wrong, or if I need to elaborate on something yet further. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.